I'm Harriet Vanceball, cardiologist and clinical trialist from McMaster University in Canada, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have with me Professor Mark Banaka from the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And uh, we are here at ACC 2025 to discuss his late-breaking clinical trial, STRIDE. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, it is so fabulous to see yet another trial that tests the efficacy of the GLP-1 RA semaglutide, which has really been transformative in the care of people with diabetes, those with established cardiovascular disease, those with hef puff, and now you've tested it in people with peripheral arterial disease. Give us some background on what is known about the medical management of peripheral arterial disease and the question you sought to answer. Yeah, well, thank you. Um... You know, peripheral artery disease is a particularly challenging disease state. It's prevalent. There's over 230 million people globally that have it. Um, but particularly when combined with diabetes, we see patients with small vessel disease, disease below the knee, and we don't have great interventional options. We don't have great medical therapies. In the U.S., we have one drug that's recommended in the guidelines, Solostazole, which is rarely used because it's contraindicated in patients with heart failure, it's poorly tolerated and has no other benefits. And so we really have very little uh, alternatives to help this really disabled population. And so that was the promise of Stride, that perhaps uh, since we haven't had a new drug in a quarter of a century, this may be an opportunity to improve outcomes. What were the inclusion criteria? Yeah, so we recruited patients with diabetes and symptomatic peripheral artery disease. They had to have a limitation in their walking but we selected patients at the earliest clinical stage of PAD. And then we use a Fontan classification. Class 2 is symptomatic disease. And we picked class 2A, meaning they had symptoms, but they could still walk 200 meters or more. So this was really the earliest stage. And we did that because, in theory, you want to intervene at earliest stages of disease. But also, practically, patients get um, bailout revascularizations, other treatments that would make it very difficult to measure a difference in outcomes. So we selected early stage PAD. So some might say that the comorbidities of this patient population were such that GLP-1 RAs might be indicated in them to begin with. So how did you tease out the specific component of PAD from all of the other benefits uh, that patients might receive from this class of medications and also have a population without a lot of uh, roll in? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, this was a population with diabetes. So it's one that has an indication for GLP-1 yeah. uh, uh, agonist therapy. Um, you know, it, it is interesting. This population is different than some of the others in that they're not obese. And about a third of the population had a BMI of less than 27. And so when we think about adoption of GLP-1s, there's been a lot of momentum around obesity and obesity outcomes. This is not an obese population. Um, they have a lot of other comorbidities. And, and even though they have diabetes, they were very well treated. I mean, they had LDLs less than 70. Their, their um, glycemia was well controlled and other things. So this was really a population whose dominant morbidity was PAD. Tell us about the trial methods. So this was a, a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind uh, prospective trial. It was uh, 800 patients, so well-powered for a functional outcome. Uh, we followed patients for a year. They were randomized to the one milligram dose, sub-Q, weekly versus placebo. And our primary endpoint was uh, maximal walking distance on a constant load treadmill, which is a very rigorous method of assessment. And to give you a, a context, um, there are a lot of trials of six-minute walk where a 20-meter difference would be considered clinically meaningful. Here, we had people walk around the same speed on a 12% grade, so like up a hill, and we didn't limit the duration. They could walk as long as they could. And so it was real world in the sense of no limitation in time, adding a hill to it. Um, and that's a very rigorous assessment of the primary endpoint. Okay. And what were the primary and secondary endpoints? So the primary endpoint was the change in maximum walking distance from baseline to one year. And then we had a whole host of other endpoints that were meant to support that because this is a functional endpoint study. So we wanted to understand symptoms, pain-free walking distance. We wanted to understand quality of life. So the vascular call six and the SF36. We wanted to understand mechanisms. So we looked at biomarkers. We also looked at the ankle brachial index to get a measure of hemodynamics. 
And finally, um, although this is supposed to be a low risk population, we looked at progression leading to reva revascularization or, or rescue treatment, um, mortality and adverse limb events. And what were the baseline characteristics of your patients? Yeah. So, so, uh, the population was, had many of the comorbidities as, as you'd expect. They had, uh, about 68 to 70 years of age, um, at baseline. You know, there are a lot of hypertension. They all had diabetes um, and other risk factors. About a fifth of them had other manifestations of cardiovascular disease, like a prior MI or a stroke or something like that. Um, I think notably, as I mentioned before, they weren't obese overall, and a third of them had a BMI less than 27, and they um, were very well treated. You know, the baseline LDL was 69, very high use of statins, antiplatelet drugs, and other agents. Okay, so and the, those baseline therapies were balanced between the groups? Yeah, everything was balanced uh, per randomization. So were patients in the placebo group allowed to have uh, GLP-1-RA therapy added on during the trial intervention period? And if so, what proportion received them? Yeah, that's a great question. So the uh, primary analysis was intention to treat. So despite differential drop-in of GLP-1 RAs, which, you know, in any trial, you could treat a patient the way you think you should, and they have to drop out of treatment. They could also get revascularized, and we know that improves walking distance and function. They could get um, increasing doses of solostazole. All of those things could happen. Overall, we did see more drop-in therapy in the control group. Okay. And anticoagulant use was equal between the two groups? It was equal between the two groups, yeah. Okay. So tell us your primary treatment effect. Yeah, so um, you know, overall, we asked the question, would semaglutide improve maximal walking distance? And the answer was yes. Met its primary endpoint. Um, there was a significant improvement in maximal walking distance. And we had this internal anchor-based measure to determine the clinical meaningfulness of the change. And that had an odds ratio of 1.79 was highly statistically significant. So met its primary endpoint with a clinically meaningful di difference we saw the benefit even at six months, and the curves continued to diverge over a year. Um, and then in absolute terms, because a lot of times that's how we think about this with patients, uh, there was an improvement, a mean improvement around 40 meters. Okay. And were any benefits in the secondary endpoints consistent? Yeah. So we looked across all of the different um, secondary and exploratory endpoints. As I mentioned, pain-free walking distance or symptoms, quality of life, um, hemodynamics, and every one of the pre-specified secondary endpoints is positive. So we improved symptoms along with function, quality of life, and even the acrobrachial index. Okay. So um, what are your next steps uh, in this body of work? Yeah. Or what, were your trial design elements adequate to potentially get regulatory approval for the drug and PAD? Yeah, so this was designed uh, as a trial for registration. So, um, it, you know, it's up to the company to decide if they whether they want to file, but they should be able to based on the conduct of the trial. Um, and I and I hope that they do because I think that's an important uh, step for patients with PAD. From a clinical perspective, you know, I, I would say there's a couple of key learnings here. One, there's been a lot of debate about you know what's driving the benefit. Is this just all weight loss? And, you know, there are two things that we saw that tell me that there's really a direct vascular effect. One, in patients with a normal BMI, there was an equal benefit. And the weight loss was modest. And even though there was a correlation with the outcome, it was very weak and did not explain the magnitude of benefit. The second is the increase in ABI, which we've not seen with the drug before. And so I think that there's a clear direct vascular benefit. The, the last comment I'll make, um, which was striking to me, is there's been discussion around sarcopenia and worries around weight loss and what that does to muscle. Patients with PAD are very uh, vulnerable to sarcopenia because they have ischemia in the limbs. They have muscle dysfunction already. And the fact that this population improved to this magnitude, walking up a steep grade, tells me that there was no significant effect of sarcopenia, at least over the year that we treated them. And on that issue, what were the adverse events that you observed? Yeah, we... Um, you know, the trial was uh, relatively small given all of the other studies with semaglutide, so there was really nothing unexpected. Um, serious adverse events were balanced, 20% in each group. We saw more GI side effects, appetite loss, all those sort of things that you would expect. 
nothing um, severe like pancreatitis or other severe outcomes or no imbalances. So really very consistent with the known safety profile. Okay, fantastic. So tell us um, your summary and any implications that you would like the audience uh, to know. Yeah. Well, as you know, you started with this comment of the GLP-1 RAs, you know, they do all these great things, cardiometabolic benefits, MACE benefit, kidney benefits. I think Stride adds an important piece of information that in patients with symptomatic PAD, for which we have very few, if any, effective therapies, uh, they improve, some agglutide improves function, symptoms, quality of life and hemodynamics. And that's, that's a huge step forward um, for as a clinician in this space. This is the first drug we've ever had that makes people live longer and feel better and function better in PAD. And these are drugs that we can use tomorrow in our clinics, um, you know, based on the basis of their approval for diabetes and other, other indications. And so for me, it will make a big difference. And I think it also opens the door for further investigation into broader populations including those without diabetes. Right, so a broad range of uh, benefits with this class of medications across disease states with evidence from the range of trials that the benefit is not just mediated through weight loss, but potentially a combination of hemodynamic, uh, inflammatory, and other metabolic benefits. Thank you so much for joining us this Thanks, morning. Daddy. And congrats on your presentation. Thank you.